Good evening. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. The best place to be. Amen. Let's all stand, if you will, and join in singing. Page 456. 456. I need thee every hour. 456. I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord. Well, what a great song. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. You'll see beautiful flowers down here, and this is a remembrance of what has gone on yesterday and today. Homegoing services for dear saints of God, Ray Compton, and then on today, Frank Jorgensen, and I know you'll be praying for uh, the ladies, if you'll pray for Doris and pray for Joan, and uh, pray that God's comfort will be upon each of these families. And uh, there, there, there are several who are sick in our midst, and COVID's trying, another, another version, uh, all of these other versions of COVID are trying to rear their ugly heads and things, and, and um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just setting my heart and my mind that I'm, I'm going to serve the Lord and, and just be faithful as, as God will allow me to be faithful, and I encourage you to do the same thing. You, you just follow the Lord's direction, the Lord's leading, and uh, you don't have to prove anything to anybody down here. We're not asking you to, you know, be a hero and, and, and fall in line, do as we do, no. Uh, but I believe that God's honored when we do what God says. I believe that God's honored in that instead of uh, just hunkering down in fear. And, and uh, I, I, I don't look forward to all the masking and things. I feel like all that is coming back. I just have a sense in my heart. It might have something to do with election time coming. I don't know. Um, but uh, it might have something to do with that. Um, but, you know, uh, for the first time, I was at Sanford Hospital. Pastor Jim, I was at Sanford Hospital. And um, uh, th let's see, yesterday, I guess it was. Um, and Hope and I were there visiting Charlotte Nelson. And they did not have a table out there to give out masks. Normally have to, you know, 
and do this hand sanitizer and, and then they give you a mask and, and you can't go anywhere before you mask up. And I looked around, I didn't see any table, didn't see any masks, didn't see any hand sanitizer, didn't see anything. I just walked on up to the table and I handed her my driver's license and I didn't ask and she didn't say. And so Hope and I just walked on in the hospital for the first time in two and a half years without having to wear a mask. Uh, people looked at us from time to time because everybody else seemed to seem to still have masks on. But um, uh, folks, you know, it's when when we're in the elevator talking, it's hard to communicate to somebody like this, you know. And I think that's part of the goal that Satan has is just to keep people uh, from you know. You know, it's it, it's it's difficult to witness to someone when you get a mask on, and uh, that that's definitely uh, something. But, uh, but do pray for folks that are sick and, and uh, uh, when, when the body aches hit and, and all that stuff and the headache and the high fever and, you know, you know, we've had that before. I mean, it just didn't start two years ago. You know that. We've had that before. So, but, but when that happens, man, please uh, do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Take all your liquids and vitamins and go to the doctor if you need to. Stay home and rest and, and, uh, and get, get over the thing and get better and then, and then come on back. So, uh, so anyway, I'm just uh, uh, praying for, for a lot that, that uh, I would love to be here and, and they're in a bed of affliction. So, so we're glad to look forward to having them back. And then let me just add this. I'm not going to go through. I've, I've, I've spent time announcing. I've spent time emailing and uh, even emailed uh, uh, the wrong uh, web address, uh, nationalwriteyourcongressman.com. I said .gov first. And I had to send out, a, I sent out a second one real quick and it said .com. So, uh, but anyway, there's lots of ways to reach your congressmen, senators, and that kind of thing. But I'll tell you, folks, if you're, if, if you're not aware of what's going on, I feel like I'm back in West Virginia. And if you're driving down the turnpike in West Virginia, you'll have these mountainsides that you're driving by. And they have, they have um, uh, I don't know, uh, rocks that start just rock slides that start you know, coming down off the mountain. And, and just keep on coming and rocks. That's what I feel like is happening. It, it's a pace that's being picked up. And the latest, the latest thing is this Respect Marriage, Marriage Act. Respect Marriage Act. And it does everything except respect marriage. Amen. Does everything except that. It's already passed the House. Didn't know that. It's in the Senate. They're trying their best to get... Uh, uh, a few, all they need is five Republican senators. And uh, thank God ours hopefully is not on the list of, of the ones that could waffle. But, uh, but five senators uh, to, and then what they could do is they could make sure that people could marry not just uh, same sex, but so they could marry a child. They're calling them minor attracted people minor attracted people folks but for the grace of God but for the grace of God so um, so anyway if you're interested go online you can find out all about it you and uh, get in on some some uh, uh, people that will tell you the truth and find out for yourself and uh, but I'm telling you it's war and I'm not talking about bullets. I'm not talking about knives or bombs. I'm talking about spiritual warfare that's going on. So, um, so anyway, we need to pray much. And when he comes up and he reads the prayer list, and number one, uh, I think, is praying for our leaders and our government, please take that very seriously. God bless you, Pastor Jim. Come on ahead, please, if you would. Well, that reminds me of Jerry Lee Lewis. Back in the 50s, married his 13-year-old cousin. Looks like we're back full circle. It's crazy. Uh, Brother Ben, would you come up and pray for us? And if no one's told you they love you today, I love you. The Lord loves you. Amen. And we ought to love each other. 
This side should love that side. <laughs> Amen. This group here ought to love this group over here. And he said, you'll know my disciples because they have love one toward another. Yes. And we're not talking about Hollywood love. We're talking about God's love. Let's pray for the president, government officials. Boy, we need to pray. We need to pray for the calendar to start flipping, 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 flipping. Pray for the peace of Israel. Pray for our missionaries. Jim and Sharon Crawford. You know, Jim is on watch in home hospice. So he'll be number three if he passes away today or tomorrow so we don't know when but God does and uh, Patricia Johnson, Johnson she got out and got home and uh, she was very happy because she was passing a lot of blood didn't know where it was coming from and they found it and fixed it and she said I'm going to be in church Sunday I said wonderful Charlotte Nelson, uh, she's still over in the Sanford Hospital. And Mona Taylor, you know, I heard yesterday at the, at the funeral that Mona was going to have a, a heart cath this morning. So I called her up. She said it had to be there at 6 o'clock. Well, at quarter to 6, she wasn't there, and I called her. <coughs> and bless her heart. She said, they called me and said, I don't have to be there till 7. But she didn't call me. <laughs> have you ever sat in the parking lot of a hospital for an hour and 15 minutes waiting? That's a long wait. But you know what? When I'm doing things, an hour goes like this. Bam, bam, bam. That's a long day. But she got it okay. She's at home. They found a little bit of blockage, but it wasn't anything that the doctor said that they had to deal with. So she's very happy about that. Miss Mona, if you're watching. The Sweets are going to Costa Rica. The Tuts are going to Romania. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Continue the prayer. Salvation for loved ones, lots of them. Mark Fleming, Hope's dead, Jack Burnside, Bruce Wasson, cancer, Gwen Sullivan's brother, David Bates, cancer, Marjorie Long's sister, Dot, colon cancer, Carpinko's daughter-in-law, Pam, cancer, Kathy Mills, Donna Stewart, and Kathy's husband, I forget his name, but they all got COVID a year ago in September. This past year, and they, and I told you the other day, if you was here, she was out cutting bushes that big around, and sweating very profusely, and hardly could walk around. I said, "What are you doing out here?" Well, it's got to be done. I said, "Well, you don't have to do it. I'll get somebody to do it. I want to do it. Don't get nobody." Okay, she's a tough lady. Betty Buffum's uh, brother, Harold Russell, cancer. Uh, Fink's granddaughter, Hope, non-Hodgkin's -Hodg lymphoma. Eunice uh, Fowles' brother, Bruce, prostrate, cancer. Jerry Herbert, cancer. Daryl and Cheryl's brother, Meryl Scrimmager, Lou Gehrig's disease. Shanice's mom, uh, Stacy, with breast cancer. Donna Thompson's brother-in-law, Kenny, with cancer. And Jim Duvier, Parkinson's disease. And on the back, the Good News Clubs is cranking up pretty quick when school starts. So let's continue to pray for them and the young people to be saved. All Amen. right. Thank you, brother. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity that you've given us. We're thankful for each person who's able to be here tonight. We're uh, thinking especially of these families who have lost loved ones, for the Jorgensons, for uh, the Comptons, and for uh, the
Crawford family. We pray that you will give your grace and strength and meet the needs that they have. I pray that you will lift up those who are sick. We pray especially for Pastor Tim and Miss Kayla that you will raise them up. And uh, we, we thank you that you hear and answer our prayers. We're thankful for uh, the opportunity that we have to cry out to you. I pray that you will continue to work a mighty work. Please bless the leaders and um, help steer them in the right direction. We know you're ultimately in control and we ask for your direction and the way things are going. We're thankful for the good news clubs that are going to be starting. I pray that you will uh, bless the folks involved with that and prepare hearts to receive your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This song tonight we're going to sing is on page 444. I've got a mansion. You know, this world is not our home. I know we've got a lot of issues going on, and we need to pray for them and pray that God will work revival in our hearts. But we're just pilgrims passing through. This is not my home. And we shouldn't get so tied down to this world that we forget that. Amen? And this song's about that. Let's stand and sing about that mansion that he's got for us prepared. 444. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. this song. <clears throat> We've not had it in our hymn book to sing for some time, so that's a blessing to have it again. But I, when I sing this, I see pictures of young people in my eyes, young people that were part of the youth group that I grew up in in church. And this is a song we sang all the time on an old church bus <laughs> when we would go places. And it was, I can see right now in my mind the faces of all those young people, my friends I grew up with. God is good, isn't he? He's just really good. Verse 2. Though often tempted, tormented and tested,
seated. Amen. Well, ushers, if you'll make ready, please. We'll make ready for our offering. And uh, Brother Gary, if you'll come, leave us in prayer, please, sir, if, as the men are coming. And be in your place on Sunday morning. Sunday school. Sunday school is a place where to, to grow and to connect and make friendships and all this kind of thing. Uh, you can come to church and just do the surface thing of church and just kind of get lost in the crowd and and I was at church and all but if you get in Sunday school that's where you that's where you dig into the meat of God's word that's where you share one another's burdens and you pray one for another lifting up one another in prayer and uh, you have activities you have fun you can ask questions a whole lot easier in a Sunday school class and so I encourage you find a place and you be there at nine o'clock be in your place Let's bow in prayer. Brother Gary, come leave us in prayer, please, if you would. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here this evening. We thank you for this time that we can come in and be refreshed from the world, Lord, that we can just put the world behind us, that uh, more than anything, that we can just concentrate on our worship and praise for you, Lord, and what you've done for us, Lord, especially as we get ready to give of our tithes and offerings, Lord, that we're just giving back just a portion of what you've already done for us, Lord. And we thank you for the privilege, Lord. And the Bible tells us to do it with a cheerful heart, Lord. And I pray that that would be our intent, Lord, would be to give something back to you with cheerfulness in our heart of thanksgiving of what you've done for us. We thank you for all these that are here tonight. We thank you for Pastor and ask you to bless the message you've laid on his heart tonight, Lord. And we give you the thanks for all that you do for us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Kathy Kendrick, if you'll come, please. And I want you to listen to this song. This is, this is a wonderful song. Uh, some people have called it the Whippoorwill song. But a better title of it is, I Give You Freedom. I Give You Freedom. And it, it sounds like the kind of song that you would hear a happy bird sing. And that's, I think, why they gave it the, the, uh, one of those titles of the Whippoorwill song. But I want you to listen to the message that Kathy is about to sing. Where God's telling us, I give you freedom to choose. God bless you. I set the boundaries of the ocean vast, carved out the mountains from the distant past. Molded a man from the miry clay, breathed in him life, but he went astray. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I write the music for the whippoorwills. Control the planets with their rocks and rills, but give you freedom to use your own will. I hold the waters in my mighty hand, spread out the heavens with a single span, make all creation tremble at my voice, but my own sons come to me by choice. I own the cattle on a thousand hills, I write the music for the whippoorwills, control planets with their rocks and rills, but give you freedom to use your own will. Even the oxen know the master stall, and sheep will recognize the shepherd's call. I could demand your love, I own you twice, but only willing love is worth the price. I own the cattle on a thousand hills, I write the music for the whippoorwills, I live on the rocks and rills, but 
give you freedom to use your own will. And if you want me to, I'll make you whole. I'll only do it though if you say so. I'll never force you for I love you so. I give you freedom, is it yes or no? I give you freedom, is it yes or no? I give you freedom, yes or no. Well, thank you, Kathy. That was great. Haven't heard that in many years. Brother Les, have you, I, I'm just looking. Well, it, okay. He, he, he's coming back. All right. The Bible is the inspired Word of God, and it will make a difference in your life. Either this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Turn your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. Mark 16. As we're studying through the Bible, we're on our second message in Mark, and uh, we're going to launch uh, out of Mark, uh, use this verse as a springboard, and to deal with, with a subject that needs to be dealt with, that the Lord's laid on my heart, about the Gospels themselves. And so, uh, Mark 16, verse 15. If you'll stand, please, we'll read this one verse together. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 the Bible says, say it aloud with me together, please. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Once, one more time. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Thank you. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. Lord, we spent some time looking at the good news and the fake news and the bad news. And Lord, I thank you that you give us good news. And I pray now that you would help us to not be ashamed of the good news, not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. Lord, I pray now that you would help us to listen to your Holy Spirit. Lord, guide me, I pray. Touch these lips of clay. And Lord, help us to magnify and lift up and, and, and to please you as we glorify Jesus Christ. Lord, we're asking you to help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why are there four Gospels? Have you ever heard this little story? Someone walk up to a man and say, Have you stopped beating your wife? There is not a good answer to that. If you say... Yes, I have stopped beating my wife. That's, that's bad in and of itself. If you say, no, I haven't stopped beating, that's all, that's even worse. Okay, there's not a good answer to that. You know, there are foolish questions. There are, there are questions that, that just gender strife. And by the way, gentlemen, uh, only put a loving hand to caress your wife. Amen? And... Um, uh, there's, there's no excuse for that, no excuse for that. But this, this question of why are there four Gospels, I know a lot of people would think, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, why, why were there four, you know? Why, why wasn't there just one, or why, why isn't there six? Is there a reason? Uh, who, who decided that? And so I'm, I know a lot of people have uh, these kinds of questions. And, and if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, I want to point out something as we get started here this evening. Hebrews chapter number 2, and by the way, I believe that God is going to use the book of Hebrews in the tribulation period. God's going to uh, turn the, uh, the Jews loose, uh, the ones who turn to Jesus Christ, and they're going to be like, uh, 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 like Apostle Paul's running around, um, and... Uh, it's going to be a marvelous time. I don't think they're going to be using as much Romans Road as they are the Hebrew Highway and leading people to Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Next verse, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now look up here, hold your place there, look up here. 
Make sure and understand that this gospel, the, the, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation by grace that he paid for at Calvary, he's saying, hey, let's not let that slip. Let's not, uh, uh, let's not get distracted with other things. Let's keep the main thing the main thing because it came from the Lord and then those who witnessed the Lord and then God confirmed those who witnessed the Lord with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit and God was saying these they're telling the truth. All this was coming from God, and God gave his seal of approval and confirmation upon it. And, and from, those, from those writers, then, we have, we have the inspired uh, word of God in the, in, the, in the Gospels. Skip down to verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 says, But we see Jesus. Say those four words aloud with me, please. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Let me tell you something. If we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is only one gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, there's one. And uh, uh, if you are looking at uh, an accident, sometimes tragically you drive by and you see an automobile accident. And you'll see people out there trying to gather information and, and trying to get uh, eyewitness testimony. And, and this, this person saw it from, a, uh, uh, from behind, and that person saw it from the other lane. And, and this person was, was standing there getting ready to cross the street, and he saw it from a different perspective. And, they're, and they're, they're, they're compiling all of these from different perspectives of the same event. Now, there's not more than one way of salvation. There's only one way of salvation, Jesus Christ. And, and so the point of the Gospels is so that we'll see Jesus, and he is the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me, just for a moment, let me, um, this, this thought of four presentations or four perspectives of Jesus, four viewpoints of Jesus, the same Jesus, that's what we have here. And I believe it's a biblical thing that we can trace through God's Word. Uh, if, you, if you look back, and you don't have to turn right now, but if you, if you look back in the Old Testament, you'll find that uh, during the Exodus and, and as the uh, children of Israel constructed the tabernacle, God instructed them how to set up camp. God instructed them uh, these three tribes are going to be on this side, these three tribes on that side, these three tribes on the other side, and these three tribes. And if you took an aerial view with the tabernacle in the center, if you took an aerial view of the setup of that, you would see what? You'd see the outline of the cross. Now, that was not coincidence. That was God saying exactly how they were to line up. Also, according to Numbers chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, God's telling uh, Moses, every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. And so they were to, to uh, uh, set up their, um, uh, their, their tents, their dwellings according to tribe and according to their banner, their ensign, uh, their, their uh, uh, let's see, their, their, their standard. And it's interesting, uh, there was one standard that uh, uh, in the West, it was a standard of an ox. One standard was the standard of an eagle. Another standard was the standard of a lion. You've heard of the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Uh, another was the, the standard of a man, of a human. And that was the banner that they had for those three tribes. The ox, the eagle, the man, and the lion. And uh, this is not the only time that this is referenced in the Word of God. In fact, uh, jot down this, this reference, Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, had the image of a man. Okay, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the, had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Now, this is Ezekiel's vision 
of what has been called the four-faced man. Uh, this, this, this vision representing uh, the Lord and in, these, in, in this way. You might say, well, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a strange thing. Um, we, f- we find that an ox has the idea of a, of a servant. That's what an, an ox, you, you, you hardly ever take an ox to a, a, a pony show or something like that. Uh, you don't even take it to a rodeo. You know, you might take some kind of a, a cow, bull, or something like that to a rodeo, a horse, or something like that. But, but an oxen, they're too slow. But they're very strong. They're a beast of burden. And then the eagle. The eagle is a, is, is a reminder of, of God. Man is a reminder of, of, of humanity. And, and the lion is a reminder of king. We're going to see that again. Look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7. I'm just comparing Scripture with Scripture. The Bible says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. We see this in heaven in Revelation, and this is is a reminder of the power and the person and the presence of God. So, it's interesting as we study the Gospels, As we look at the gospel from Israel's perspective, we see Matthew presenting Jesus Christ. You see, Matthew, uh, God used him to present the gospel from Israel's perspective. Um, This was about the king. They were looking for the Messiah. The kingdom of heaven is, is all throughout, written all throughout Matthew. Uh, it, the beginning of Matthew chapter 1, it, it, it presents the royal lineage, the royal line of David and, and also of Abraham, the promised line of Abraham. Now, Abraham was not a king, but the promise came through Abraham and his seed that the, king, the kingly line would come through that promised line. And so you, you find there in Matthew chapter 1, uh, the, the lineage, and it mentions David first and of Abraham. And it lists all that out there, pointing to the royalty of Jesus Christ. Matthew 2, 2 is a, is a key verse. The Bible says, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We don't find the, uh, the other gospels uh, giving uh, point to the, to the wise men like this, seeking the king of the Jews. Matthew 21, verse 5, Jesus said this, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, uh, the foal of an ass. So Jesus is saying, I am the king of the Jews. Revelation 19, 16, the Bible says this, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So as you, as you read and study the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, you will find that it's a, it's a presentation from a viewpoint from God's heart to the Jews that he is the chosen anointed Messiah, the king of the Jews. You see that fitting. And, and so when, when, when you see that and you see the, the, the emblem of the lion throughout all, all in the Old Testament and the Revelation, all that, it, 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 it fits very, very well. And then you move on to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is, is uh, the gospel from a Gentile's perspective, from uh, inspired by God to, to reach and touch the hearts of a Gentile. Now, now listen, please. As, as we look at this, we think of um, all throughout Mark, there's, there's nothing about his lineage, nothing about Jesus' ancestry, no genealogy. The reason why in Gospel of Mark doesn't have that is because a servant, no one cares about where they came from. They're a nobody. They're not important. They're just a servant. And Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us uh, that he was, he was a servant, had a servant's heart. And uh, this, this thought about him being uh, strong to bear man's sins. Mark 10, 45 is probably the key verse where it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, you'll find immediately, the word immediately is used over and over and over. 
uh, straightway, straightway is used, boom, 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 because he's doing what God would have him to do. The book of Acts says that Jesus went about doing good. Let me ask you something. Do you go about trying to do good? Do you try to encourage someone's heart? You realize that that's what Jesus did? A servant, a servant. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says that Jesus made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Hmm. I wonder, when the Bible talks about Jesus kneeling down in front of his disciples and, and putting the towel around him and washing their stinky, dirty feet, I wonder if we'd be willing to serve one another. I wonder if we're willing to really to serve Jesus Christ in the way that Jesus served the Heavenly Father. So we see that, and, and it's, it's, uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, 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 doctrine and, and things in, in Mark. There is, but, but not, like, not like the Gospel of John, not like the Gospel of, of, of Matthew especially. Also, um, by the way, before I leave this thought of, of Matthew, since I did mention it again, when you look at the, the problem passages in the Gospel of Matthew and you look at it through the glasses of the, uh, of the Jewish nation, of Israel, it makes a lot more biblical, consistent sense. Whenever you try to force that into the lap of the church, it, it messes everything up. Um, so, Matthew, Mark, how about Luke? How about Luke? Uh, Luke is the gospel from man's perspective. We see his humanity. We see the humanity of our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, he was fully human, fully man, 100%. And, and this is a, 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 a crucial truth. This is very important. Because if he, if he was not a man, he could not die in George's place. He could not die in Jim's place. If he was an angel, he could not die in my place. You understand? He had to be 100% human. He was the God-man, and we'll deal with that in just a moment. But he was 100% man. And in the, in the Gospel of Luke, God used a doctor, Dr. Luke, to look at, at the humanity side of our Savior and, and, and to see this. Uh, throughout, throughout Luke, you see the favorite term, son of man, son of man, son of man, all, all through the, the gospel. Uh, we see the lineage starting with Adam, not starting with David, not starting with Abraham, but the lineage of Jesus Christ in the gospel of Luke starts all the way back to Adam and all the way up to Joseph and Mary proving his humanity from the creation uh, and, and, and all of that. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke, it's the only place we read about his childhood years. It's the only place we read about him being in the temple at, at 12 years of age. It's the only place that we, we read where Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, uh, showing his growth and all of that. Again, the humanity, uh, the uh, and, and, and there's some, there's some great things about that. Uh, we, we find that as he's praying and uh, as he's sweating great drops of blood out of the human pores of his body, we find an angel coming and ministering to him in his time of weakness. Do you realize that he understands the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, the Son of God, he understands what it's like to be tired. He understands what it's like to be discouraged. He turned to his disciples after he fed the 5,000. And then he began teaching them some things, and they turned and walked away. There's some folks that left tonight. They left earlier, and uh, I hope they'll come back. It's discouraging when you see people turn their back and they, and they leave. It's discouraging. He turned to his disciples and he said, will ye also go away? He knows what it's like to be lonely. He does. The humanity, 
his prayer life. Uh, nine, no less than nine times in the Gospel of Luke do we find Jesus uh, pointedly going in prayer. Most of the time, uh, uh, early, early in the morning, sometimes all night in prayer. Nine times in the Gospel of Luke. Why would the Son of God need to go pray? Why would the second person, the Godhead, need to go pray to the Heavenly Father? He prayed as a human man, he prayed. Let me prove some things to you about the humanity. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10, 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. 100% man, just as man as any other, any other human being in here. Hebrews 4, 15, uh, uh, the Bible says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. If he was just the son of God, and I don't mean that irreverently, but if he was not um, uh, uh, in human flesh, then how could we sense in our heart that he understands what we're going through when we bring our needs to the throne of grace? And here's probably one of the best verses about this. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's what the verse is saying. It's saying that when it's your time to stand up to bat and you're, you're handed the bat, in a, I'm using a metaphor here of a baseball game, and you're standing before God the Father, you're standing before Almighty God, and he's looking at you and he sees an old dirty scoundrel of a sinner. But Jesus steps April 10th, 1970. He covered me with his robe of righteousness. He took my penalty. He took my place. Made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the gospel from man's perspective, the gospel from Israel's perspective, the gospel from Gentiles' perspective, and now the gospel from God's perspective, the gospel of John. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, no genealogy in, in the gospel of John. How do you have a genealogy for God? No, there is none. So it just starts out saying, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14 says. Son of God is used over and over and over and over in the Gospel of John. Jesus is not just fully man, he is fully divine. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said this, I and my Father are one. He went on to say in John 14, when Philip asked him, he said, it saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's why Jesus came, so that he could show the Father to this world. Let me remind you, if I might, book of Exodus chapter 3, remember when God called Moses? Remember how that he wanted him to go and, to, uh, and, and for him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? And one of the complaints that Moses gave was, who do I say has sent me? He said this, Exodus 3, 14, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now, this was the Old Testament. This was the Jewish understanding of who God is. The I am, the self-existent one. The one who was before anything. The self-existent one. The I am, the Yahweh, Jehovah God. And so, seven times in the Gospel of John, 
Jesus said, I am. Seven times, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. So in the Old Testament, this is an interesting thought. In the Old Testament, we had an unfinished name, if, I'm, if I might be so bold. I am. And in the New Testament, we find that Jesus completed the name. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. He told, this, he, he told those who asked, he said, before Abraham was, I am. John 20, 31, talking about these gospels, the Bible says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living, the Son of God, and that, thou, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The Bible says in the previous verse, said if everything that Jesus did was written down, they suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books. But these are written that you might believe in the name of the Son of God. That's the whole purpose. That's the whole reason. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when, when you take the four gospels, the four presentations... The four viewpoints and all of that. And you find that in, in the gospel of Marth, uh, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew, we find the sovereign king that, that how God used Matthew to present his royalty. And how God used Luke in the son of man to present his humanity. And how God used, used Mark uh, in, in his servant's heart and suffering servant uh, to present his humility. And how God used John to present him as a son of God so that we can see his deity. You put all that together and you have to understand if, if they were all converged into one, they couldn't have zeroed in as, as clearly. It's like four witnesses, four witnesses of the same person, the same Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not something that we're just making up. It's not something that we're forcing into the text. It's something that started way back early in the Old Testament, was again revived in Ezekiel in the Old Testament, and then is echoed again in the book of Revelation again. So was it coincidence that there were four presentations of the, God, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ? No, no. I think it was by exact design. It was God directing. Because Colossians 2, 9 says, For in him, in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus. So we, we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the manifestation of God. John chapter 4 tells us that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus said, we just read the verse, Jesus said, if ye hath seen me, ye have seen the Father. And the Holy Spirit uh, manifests through, through people and through his work, the Holy Spirit. So as far as pointing our worship, the Bible directs us to worship Jesus Christ to bow before him. And that's the good news. Some people still don't get the message, though. They can't see the forest for the trees. They want to argue about uh, a gospel of Thomas or a gospel of Judas or a gospel of this, a gospel of that, gospel of Barnabas. And, and, and why, why, didn't, why, why isn't that in the Bible? God knew exactly what he was doing. He put it together consistently. And, and although these things are not laid out by the writers of the Gospels, understand that the author of the Gospels, Almighty God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, 
that he put all these things together beautifully and perfectly so that there's no uh, conflict, there's, there's, there's no uh, contradiction in God's word from Old Testament to New Testament. It's all the same. And yet people still just miss it. They miss the beauty. Kind of like the guy back in the days when, when uh, Morse code was big. He went in, he, he understood that there was a, uh, a job opening and, and it paid pretty well. And it was for uh, people to, you know, do that with the telegraph and to take messages and, and to listen to messages and send messages on Morse code. So he showed up and he's there in the office and there's, there's about seven or eight other, other guys in there waiting and they're, they're just waiting to be called. Well, you know, things are happening and, and it's kind of hustle and bustle and, and things. And, and there, was, there was a sound in the background. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. And, you know, they're just sitting there. This one guy all of a sudden jumps up. He jumps up and he, and, he, and he goes up to the door and he opens the door and he, and he walks on in and in about 10 minutes he walked back out. He had a great big old smile on his face. He said, I got the job. They said, what? How did you, I didn't even see him call you. No, no, no. You see, over the airwaves, they were sending that message. If you understand this, the first person to come in and come into my office, I will give you the job. And that guy sitting there, he just figured it out, and he jumped up and went in, and he took it, and he got the job. You know, folks, we're not talking about rocket science here. Jesus Christ loved us so much, he came to die in our place. And it was in the heart of God, planned before, he, b before the world began. And we see the beauty of how God put it all together. It must be real. It must be 100% accurate. There is, there is no conflict with God's word. The question is, are you going to act on it? Are you going to receive the message? Are you going to be distracted by everything else going on around? And God says, I want to give you the very best. Her song, Kathy's song. I give you freedom. Is it yes or no? Let's bow our heads together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would help us to see that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have preserved your word, presented it, picturing Jesus Christ for all eyes, both Israel, Gentiles, for, for man to see himself in Jesus Christ, the humanity, and then to see the deity that he's fully divine, the Son of God. Lord, help us not to miss your message. Help us, dear God, to obey what you say to do in the message. Whatever it may be that the Holy Spirit's sending into our hearts, Help us, Lord, to say, yes, Lord, I'll jump up. I'll obey you because I'll stand before you one day. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you stand with me, please? Everyone standing. Before we're dismissed, would you at this moment invite Jesus Christ to take charge anew and afresh in your life? I understand most people that are here in this room are born-again believers. I understand that. But is there a closet? Is there a drawer? Is there a room in your heart that's locked away that Jesus Christ doesn't have the key to? You haven't handed it to him. Won't you give that to him? Maybe it's a hurt. Maybe it's something that, that, that someone did to you and you're holding on to that unforgiving spirit. Maybe it's not obeying 
in handing gospel tracts and pointing people to Jesus. I don't know what it might be, but would you tonight say, you are my Savior, you are my Lord, you are my King. I surrender anew and afresh unto thee. Do that, would you? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you if there's something that you need to confess, something to release. Let him do that for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for our time that we've had together. Thank you for your precious word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to study it like it's bread, like it's meat, and Lord, that it'll sustain our souls. I pray that you would watch over those that are hurting today, Lord, those that are sorrowing, those that are sick, Lord, restore their health, I pray. And Lord, help us to serve you and to worship you again on Sunday and every day in between. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you folks. So good to have you here tonight. And I hope you have a great evening. Uh, be strong, be healthy, be well. We'll see you Sunday. God bless you.